Hey everybody, I'm Robert. And I'm Chris. And we're the Film Flamers. Bringing you the latest Shooting the Flames as we come into May. Wait. (laughs) (laughs) As we find ourselves in the lusty month of May. (laughs) No, you were right the first time. Oh my god, yeah, so it's Shooting the Flames, the uh, monthly show where Chris and I get together to talk about movie news, trailers, and most importantly, comments and questions and reviews from you, our listeners. And voicemails. And voicemails. Now, we got lots of things going on in Shooting the Flames these days. But uh, before we get into that, can we talk about what is (laughs) essentially old news now, but Will Smith slapping the shit out of Chris Rock at the Oscars? Yeah, because I feel like the last time we sat down to talk, we were about, like, literally, I think, that that night, Mm -hmm. we're going to go see the Oscars. That's right. And so this sounds like it's an eternity ago at this point. It really does. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys want our takes, but we were in the Alamo Draft House movie theater watching this live when the MC was like, Did that just happen? <laughs> he was like, I <laughs> and think everyone we need in the theater started just going And everyone was like arguing about what, you know, and then and then people were starting to pull up on their phones. You know, the actual uncensored, you know, slap and all that stuff. So I don't know. I'm tired of talking about it. I'm tired of thinking about it. Yeah. But, I know. you know, I think our take is, you know, obviously the guy, you know, took away from an otherwise kind of extraordinary night, uh, especially for like women and, you know, LGBT issues. Yes. I completely agree with you. I think there was a lot of gay representation, especially on like winners and nominees that night. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, people uh, like in the deaf community and things like that. You know, like there was lots of special moments that are overshadowed because Will Smith didn't like someone making fun of his wife, you know, and like, I don't know. I really thought it was fake at first. Hmm. And then, you know, seeing that uncensored shit on Twitter or whatever. um, I don't know. But we had talked about like recording a little snippet of something to throw into the last shoot in the flames, like after the fact. And I was like, no, let's just like hold off on the takes for now and see what happens. But yeah, maybe our thoughts will kind of evolve, but nope. (laughs) No. Although he's been slapped with some penalties. So yeah, well, whatever, you know, don't, (laughs) don't throw punches at the fucking Oscars. Don't fucking assault someone on live TV. (laughs) I mean, so he's resigned from the Oscars and he cannot take part in any of the shows for the next 10 years. So I hope he doesn't get nominated for anything else. Good thing he won for that movie. You know, you know, I've historically been a fan, you know, and and he's a talented guy, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, I feel like, Jada may not be the best person for him, but now we're getting into tabloid stuff and I don't really want to go there. Yeah. And I don't care enough, you know what I mean, about their relationship. So it's fine, but I'm going to agree with you at least in part. Yeah. Just based on the things that she has said. Yeah. You know, and the fact that he's just like gallivanting around India right now by himself. Two of his movies are essentially canceled and are put on hold. And yeah, uh, you know, articles are going either way, like they are with everything these days, but they're saying like, he's gotten more business than ever. And then, and yet like things are getting canceled. And so whatever, I don't know. Let's stop talking about it, please. All right. Let's just not say gay. Wait, that's the next (laughs) thing we're talking about. (laughs) Don't say gay. We've got the Florida stuff going on with don't say gay bill, which is kind of a misnomer really yeah a lot of people on the left are getting super super angsty but because i think that's the spirit of it but that's not really what the law says no the law is super vague and super stupid (laughs) because it says essentially that between kindergarten and like third grade uh like four to eight year olds or whatever the fuck in it's uh essentially you're not allowed to bring up anything or acknowledging sexual orientation or gender identity which, you know, fine, but that could swing any way. So essentially, if you're showing these people a Disney movie, like, I don't know, Snow White or The Little Mermaid or Aladdin or something like that, that's acknowledging the presence of a heterosexual relationship. That's and true. now you have sexualized children. That's their argument. And so now they're all over social media. The people on the far right that has eaten all this up calling all gay people groomers. And like we're pedophiles or something. Yeah. I had not heard that term before. So off mic, I asked him, I was like, what, what does this mean? And that like sort of flabbergasted me a little bit. Although not really, I'm not, I'm not surprised anything that comes out of that fucking state. I thought we were over this, you know? Yeah. I just thought we were, that was behind us. Certainly that argument, you know, but it's fires up a base. And of course the, the most passionate people have the loudest voices on social media and it makes it seem like disproportionately people are into that. And I don't think they are. 
you know, I, I, I hope not. I want to be an optimist here. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's like, guys, let's go either way. There's going to be a lot of teachers that passive aggressively will not have any story in literature or anything in history or anything else that even acknowledging like that a, a heterosexual couple exists because anytime there's a mother or a father or anything like that, in any case, it's sexualizing children, apparently. So, so stupid. It's, retar- it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I right. think everyone can agree we're not teaching kids in you know, kindergarten to third, third grade sex education. You know what I mean? Well, and how terrible is it to be a young child and you have a, a parental unit that's like two moms or two dads and <clears throat> like it doesn't get acknowledged? I mean, it's like seriously teaching children that their own parents are bad and that really fucking bothers me. It's not. Yeah. It's like it's just not giving them anything. Which is like the worst thing you can do is give them a void. You know, we need to acknowledge that relationships exist and that they're about love and respect. We don't get into sex until much later in their their school career. You know what I mean? What did gay people do to just piss off Florida and Texas? I don't understand. It's people trying to win cheap political points with the worst of the worst. The basket of deplorables. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that phrase. What a good term. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it, it, if it really gets going, especially as we get into this election and DeSantis is like a real thing, that's one of the things he might actually promise a base is like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to try and do everything in my power to like dismantle same sex marriage or things like that, you know. And so those are the types of things that kind of give me just a, a little bit of pause. So, Yeah. I mean, it does. And hopefully, I mean, I feel like we could just revolt. You know what I mean? We have the, we have the most organized and fabulous revolution ever. Well, the lesbian. The left doesn't do that. The right does, right? <laughs> That's another thing. Elon Musk has bought Twitter. Oh, right? God, yeah. And so he's sending all of these uh, memes out about the left and the right. And saying, like, showing him with the left and the right, like, uh, at the time of Obama, and showing himself in the middle. And then the next graphic shows that the left has grown so far to the left that his middle has grown to the right or whatever because it's so stretched out. And, of course, that's ridiculous, Mm -hmm. you know, because it wasn't the left that is literally trying to overthrow the fucking government in a coup. That's right. On January 6th. So when you say, we're going to have a revolution, (laughs) that's not going to happen that way. I don't see the left doing the January 6th thing with guns. And no, like, we're not that violent. No. We'd have a drag show. <laughs> we would have a benefit. We will change the world through fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wear your protest shirt today. And your pussy hats. <laughs> we are making a difference. <laughs> we're just going to walk up to random people and say gay. <laughs> <laughs> gay, gay, gay. <laughs> gay, 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 gay. And Mark Hamill did just that. He wrote gay like 60,000 times or something on Twitter. <laughs> sort of on top though i mean like i was at a tori amos concert recently and she talks to the audience like one time right Mm -hmm. and so she was telling the story about how she was right before she started the tour she was being interviewed and the reporter asked where she was calling from and she said florida because that's where she lives when she's in the u.s and he was like oh i thought you were that old yeah i guess (laughs) he was like i thought you were in the united states and she was just like well kind of she's like but whenever people call me and they say you know how are you i just say gay 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 <laughs> so God bless her. Yes. She's doing the Lord's work. That's right, for real. She's gonna organize our fabulous protest t shirt mm. wearing. Yeah. Clearly. All right. Well, do you want to get into this shooting the flames? Yeah, and we can start off on a really good note, ignoring everything that we just talked about. That's right. <laughs> and say that we have a new review. Yay! By Herb Hi- Herblinger. Herb Shrust. Herb, fuck like, uh, uh, Herb Reiner. Herb Biner. Anyway, Herb Reiner says, best horror pod, informative and witty, does not disappoint. I appreciate that they talk about a wide range of horror films and horror adjacent from a variety of eras. Well, thank you. The 90s and the 80s. That's right. <laughs> Sometimes the 70s. <laughs> we've, we've done uh, pretty much... I think we've covered things from every decade. Oh, I think we, we might have even touched in the 50s a little bit. Maybe the 60s. I mean, on the top 10s, we've talked about Patreon 50s stuff, but and Deep Dives included. We've done like 60s through uh, the 2010s. 20, 20 mm-hmm. Present day, I think. Well, not present day because we're now in the 2020s. Oh, that's right. We haven't done anything super recent in the Deep Dive. Well, Dr. Sleep. That's 2010s. 
Oh, shit. God, <laughs> I have no concept of time, clearly. <laughs> He's right, though. A variety of eras. <laughs> uh, we have a shitload of comments, guys, and we're going to start with our deep dive on Drop Dead Gorgeous last month for Horror Comedy Month. And at the Jamie Grayson on Instagram said, my friend choreographed this masterpiece. We have been begging him for a musical adaptation for years. You mean it wasn't that old cr- curmudgeon lady with a cigarette hanging out of her mouth? <laughs> Who actually choreographed it? <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Uh, doing the Lord's work, really. Mm. Come on. That movie had fantastic choreography. Weren't they like like popping stools above their head and shit like that? Yeah, with paint on them. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was great. At Goodnight October from Instagram said, when I was a little gay boy, this movie was everything. And I showed it to everyone. That's how I knew someone was gay. A mere I can. You knew someone was gay because they liked it. The he movie? would do the litmus test. He would show them Drop Dead Gorgeous. And if they freaked out. <laughs> if they loved it. Yeah, if they loved it. <laughs> like, do you want to touch you there inappropriately? <laughs> That's what I'm going to start doing from now on. If I think someone's gay, but like, do you want to sit down and watch Drop Dead Gorgeous? And they say, yes. I'd be like, gay. Oh. I thought you were going to say, I like to be cuddled (laughs) and choked. I like to be cuddled and choked. (laughs) (laughs) I do. Uh, Dr. Joe over on Patreon said, I have been waiting for so long for this one. Drop Dead Gorgeous will complete my circle. Well, I'm glad we could make you happy. Battle Burrito from Patreon said, Sporty Spice, I died. I had not seen until recently. There are some things that aged poorly and some things that aged very well. Here, here. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, I called. Who did I call Sporty Spice? <laughs> that, the girl the, on the tractor that died on yeah, the tractor. the lesbian on the tractor. Yeah. <laughs> Sporty Spice. <laughs> Bennett over on Patreon said, here's a bit of trivia for you. Did you boys know that your spirit animal, that one judge who has no speaking lines whatsoever, was played by the screenwriter, Lona Williams? Does that little factoid help you better than a nice mint when your head shoved up your ass? <laughs> yes, it does, actually. I cannot believe I missed that. I can't believe it either. You're just so thorough with that shit. Yeah. A full cavity search. <laughs> <laughs> that mint was hidden. <laughs> Deep up the ass, but that person liked Drop Dead Gorgeous, so clearly they were gay. Things up the butt. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> Kimberly over on Patreon said, I just left you a voicemail regarding this episode. That was not my best work. My Minnesota alter ego will make another appearance when you least expect it. And uh, here's that voicemail. Hey, hon, it's Kimberly. Uh, your over the top Midwest accent needs a little bit of work, but it's not bad. Not bad at all. Um, so just wanted to let you know you made me laugh as usual, like I just had one too many seltzers at the Loon Lake 4th of July party. Anywho, uh, have a good day. Thanks for making me laugh, and I can't believe I've never seen this movie before. So I will have to check it out. Okay, have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs> that was perfection and we need you to like go back and so we can re-record that intro <laughs> you haven't seen this movie kimberly oh my god you have to see it and then let us know please have many seltzers and watch it <laughs> <laughs> nikki over on patreon said watch this last night for the first time so i can listen to the pod looking forward to your take very adjacent but very funny good we're glad you laughed at it from our Shooting the Flames episode back in April, Bennett on Patreon said, I don't get what Chris has against Andrew Garfield. I've been impressed with his talent and his adorable face as far back as one of his earliest films, Lions for Lambs. In that film, he was completely fresh faced and spent literally a third of the film acting opposite of and holding his own against Robert Redford, who I'm told is not one of the easiest guys to work with. Even then, I knew this was someone to keep an eye on for multiple reasons. Apparently, Chris doesn't feel the same way as I do. We must have different tastes in actors as well as men. I also read his review of Axel Ridge on his letterbox page where he described him as having a punchable face. <laughs> WTF. P.S. I'll give Chris some points about rent. I'm a bad I'm a bad gay and still have never seen it. But what I've heard of the, of the music is not for me either. All that aside, Andrew Garfield's performances in Tick Tick Boom still made him look sincerely huggable. Punchable? I don't think that he looks huggable. I don't think he looks punchable. Yeah, I, I mean, he has a, a, you know, he has an adorable, he's got like a gentle face. He looks like a gentle, like his his role in Hacksaw Ridge was very good. Like he was very well cast there. Did you see Hacksaw Ridge? I have not seen Hacksaw it's Ridge. It's really good. Yeah, I mean, like you've spoken very highly of that movie. Yeah. 
Um, I don't well, think about it. Say what you want about Mel Gibson, but the man does know story structure. <laughs> he does. And how to yell at Jews. Um, Jesus. <laughs> he's a bad man. <clears throat> uh, I don't, I don't think about Andrew Garfield at all, like either good or bad. Like he, he never pops into my head. I thought he did really good in the eyes of Tammy Faye, you know, but I don't know. I'm he's not... a powerhouse actor. I just, I'm, he's a, he's kind of tw- twinky to me. But... He's a little twinky. Not, yeah. I mean, not quite as twinky as. I'm not judging. It's just not for me. Job, folks, you know, if you're asking, <laughs> he does well, have a punchable fucking face though. <laughs> and I don't think he's that attractive either. I'm just like, I mean, it's just, he's, he's kind tall of and bird like. <laughs> he's like an ostrich. <laughs> <laughs> it's those people like there's a whole <clears throat> slew of people that go after like the Adrian Brody's and like the Andrew Garfield's and all those types the Jeff Goldblum's you know they really look like that beak like appearance I love a big nose so I can't lie like it's the if, if I have a guy in front of me with like a really big fucking schnoz or whatever I'm all about it I think Adrian Brody's super hot but <clears throat> not Andrew Garfield does he have a big nose I don't remember I don't I just can't I can't even picture him in oh, my yeah. head now Plus, I can't believe he was Spider Man. I still don't understand that either. I don't know. Anyway, sorry, Bennett. He doesn't like Andrew Garfield. I like Andrew Garfield. <laughs> All I was saying, this has got a punchable face. <laughs> <laughs> this face kind of looks like it was already punched, really. Dr. Joe from Patreon sent us a whole slurry of DMs while listening to Shooting the Flames. So let's start. He started with LMAO, that Evil Dead re-something was actually good. The other stuff from that director was bad, but Evil Dead, good. Lol. Re-something, as in we're not sure if it was a re- reboot, reboot reimagining, or... whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and then he said, no, Return of the Living Dead was not a huge influence on the genre. I will say, from a kid's review, they were very comic-like. And from a young audience perspective, they were great and comical and had so many great effects. LOL, love y'all, but if one of you slapped the other, it'd totally be a Still Magnolia's moment. <laughs> Who would be most likely to slap the other one? Slap her, she's evil. <laughs> no, here, hit this. <laughs> <laughs> I would totally up my Patreon tier for a Flamies Awards. So I guess we're going to have to do it. Yeah. Oh my God, call me out, LOL. <clears throat> so I'm actually a doctor in leadership and organizational behaviors. I was at one time pursuing a career in music theory or musicology. Right, because he was a pro flautist. Yeah. One of the, yeah. Mm-hmm. But Dr. Joe on something else. Mm. <clears throat> Western classical was my gig and my primary instrument was and still is the flute, hence my pro flautist tag. Mm. But yes, I am a doctor and I know the themes of social groups on the macro and micro. Nice. Good. Thank you for clearing that up. Uh, speaking of something we said during that shooting the flames, I think we were talking about, uh, our correction from, from Kimberly on the cold blooded, uh, dinosaurs, warm blooded dinosaurs. Yeah, that's right. She schooled us in science. Yeah. And so we we're going to ask her to school us in math or something. So I think she left us a voicemail about that. Hey, it's Kimberly school. You on math. Oh, honey. That's very, very cute. Um, that's not going to happen. The uh, only reason I never became the next Jane Goodall is because I can't math for shit. So, um, yeah. Hope you're having a good day. Bye, guys. Okay. Who can, though, really? Yeah. Math sucks. I'd rather play a flute. I'm much better with my mouth than I am with math. Okay, let's stop with the in- innuendos. I'm sorry, I think we had, our, <laughs> you know? I think we had critical mass a little while ago. <laughs> <I know. laughs> oh, my God. I have to calm myself. Next up, we have some comments from our deep dive from Death Becomes Her. And the first one was at Michael D. Stone on Twitter. He said, this was a fun romp. And in my opinion, it's Bruce Willis who stole the show. You have a point. He was kind of the anchor. And yeah. if, he, if he didn't work, none of it would have worked. That's true. And it is by far one of his best performances. So. It is. It's very different for him. Agreed. We also got a voicemail from Kimberly again. <laughs> So uh, we're not complaining, Kimberly. The more the merrier. Yeah, really. we love them. Uh, in fact, the more you can do that accent <laughs> or school us or anything else, really. <laughs> Just leave us a voicemail. Now you review Death Becomes Her? Uh, yeah, just trying to be funny. This is Kimberly. Um, absolutely love the episode, and I forgot how much I loved this movie. I watched it obsessively. Uh, I would have been about oh, eighth or ninth grade, 14, 15 years old when it came out, and I watched it a lot and um i need to go back and find it on amazon um because uh i love it um 
rumor mill has it that um, it's going to be a remake is going to be done with um, uh, Goldie Hawn's daughter Kate. What the hell is her name? I, I'm having a brain moment. Um, Kate has been uh, reprising her mother's role. Um, so anyway, I'm curious to see what that would be like. And then uh, maybe someday you guys can do an episode on a uh, horror adjacent episode about um, dating apps because Jesus Christ. Bye. I think there already are. Like, I think there's at least like a gay horror movie about it. Is there? Like, you know, straight to DVD type of stuff or straight to streaming. <laughs> <clears throat> there may have been some of that in Killer Unicorn. I can't remember now. But Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, for me too. I mean, I think you basically said the same thing me and Robert did. We, we, at least I watched the shit out of this when I was younger, mm-hmm. you know, um, and it's a, it's definitely a cult classic in any of the, our show notes though. We do link to, if there is a streaming option, we linked to it. And if it's just Blu-ray, like in the case for a, for a dropped gorgeous, which is very rare, but we do include that in our show notes. So if you want a quick link, you can always check the show notes to, to see where to, to watch something. Yeah, and you should. Like, this is one that you should buy. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, I have to have to, to watch it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And, uh, I mean, it's. I, I watched it a lot when I was a kid, enough to, like, memorize the movie. I hope so. not everyone went out and, like, watched the wrong Drop Dead Gorgeous. <laughs> the one that was on Hulu or Voodoo <laughs> whatever, or whatever? Yeah, Voodoo. Yeah, I don't know what the fuck that is, but it's not the movie we talked about. Don't do that. Do not go to Voodoo <laughs> for late. Drop Dead Gorgeous. Because <laughs> I think we told people the episode prior to <laughs> Drop Dead Gorgeous that they could go to <laughs> <laughs> and we were mistaken. And they started watching, like, what the fuck is this? You had to order the movie two day shipping. I know. <laughs> just just to watch some, I watched it in time. Good yeah. lord. I had two copies here, though. <laughs> really? I, I swore I that I had the DVD had and I have the Blu ray. I bought them twice. And... I swore that I had the DVD. I went through my entire DVD collection. I had to buy the DVD for like $80. Jesus and, then, and then a couple of years later, the Blu ray finally came out. And so I bought that. And still, though, you can't stream it. Well, now I have the Blu ray. So. Yeah. From our episode on Diary of the Dead, we have a couple more comments, and this was from way back in March, but Battle Burrito over on YouTube said, I was looking forward to this episode because this movie was such a train wreck. LOL. Mm -hmm. It is. Sean Homrig uh, on Patreon said, I just finished listening to this episode and thanks so much for going so far as to calling it Diary of the Dead. I have to defend this one. I saw it at the 2007 Fantastic Fest in Austin, and Romero was there to do an intro. And boy, could that guy smoke cigarettes and drink scotch. Yes. Maybe I'm a little biased then, but whatevs. Anyway, I really think that this was a step up from Land of the Dead and had all the creepy dread stuff that a modern zombie movie should have. I do agree that there are too many characters that all die a little too quickly at the end, and the ending with the mansion was a bit of a letdown, but the highlights for me were the scenes in the hospital and the girl's family's house. At the premiere, Romero echoed the opinion of someone in the film when he said something akin to, these running zombies are bullshit, which makes me think what he truly thought of the Dawn of the Dead remake. (laughs) Uh, The biggest thing that bothered me was why that guy showed up at his family's mansion and never took off his mummy costume. I mean, I like a bender as much as anyone else, but at least I'd put my comfy fat pants on first. (laughs) Anyway, hottest guy is Elliot. Shout out to the pale nerdy guys. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Not Elliot. <laughs> Elliot. <Sorry. laughs> Stop pointing that thing at me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't sexualize me. <laughs> and <it's> E.T. A- <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> so it's okay. I'm glad that you're defending this movie because I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't know if I'd call it a step up from Land of the Dead. They're both pretty equally bad. But I mean, like we've said before in the podcast, it's okay to disagree, right? And if if you liked this movie, then that's good. I'm glad that you're telling us why. I would sit there and watch it again just to listen to Romero talk. Like honestly, he's like my favorite. I got to meet him one time. And I will never forget it. So, yeah, I'm glad you did, too. There's such a thing as a nostalgia lens. And especially if it's wrapped in a warm, fuzzy memory like that. And that's understandable. Yeah. We are constantly referring to our nostalgia boners. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) 
I had something lined up in my head to talk about and say with Nostalgia Boner, but I've already hit my fucking innuendo quote. I'm just like, yeah. Bone home. Okay. Bone home. <laughs> okay. I want to open this drink. From our Patreon flashback into Survival of the Dead, ending our long venture into Romero zombie films. Hamrig Shans on Twitter said, uh, tweeted a pic of your copy of The Survival of the Dead uh, and said, At the Film Flamers, it was only a few bucks and I haven't seen it since it came out, so why not? It goes down like a jagged, boring <laughs> willow pill. Bourbon didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> I retweeted it and said maybe more bourbon. I don't know. <laughs> what I like about this quote so much is he has a fucking Alanis Morissette reference and a RuPaul's drag reference in the same fucking tweet. And that's how you fucking do it. Okay. <laughs> Work. <laughs> the unknown patron said, there are two plum islands, one in Massachusetts. There are two. Pl- <laughs> there are two. There are two. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Herb Herlinger. Hold on. There are two plum islands. One of. One of oh, my God. Did I have a gummy? <clears throat> there are two. <laughs> all right i won't look at you oh god i'm crying hold on (laughs) there there are two plum islands one in massachusetts which is which is like (laughs) (laughs) oh my god my outtakes are already too long <clears throat> there are two plum islands, one in Massachusetts, which is like I can't. <laughs> just take a minute. But just to read it. Okay. <sighs> there are two plum islands, one in Massachusetts, which is like I can't. <laughs> All the ones making me get it's the most favorite. boring fucking sentence I in know, the it's world. Not even it's like a Wikipedia funny. entry. Okay, you do it. <clears throat> The unknown patron also made a comment. He said, there are two. <laughs> oh, <damn it>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <sighs> Take a minute. Come back and <laughs> <laughs> you sure it's your turn now. <clears throat> there are two Plum Islands, one in Massachusetts, which is likely the one referred to in that movie. And one in New York, which is wholly owned by the United States government and is a USDA research facility and in other series, the source of the zombie apocalypse or <laughs> or other end of the world. <laughs> did it. I did it. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> no, that's interesting because like if they're using that, then I wonder if it was a reference. Yeah to other zombie movies, but I doubt that. So I wonder if it was before, after, or different, or if it was supposed to be some sort of conspiracy about that and Romero was using it. So I don't know. I mean, it could be. Also, I appreciated a geography lesson. Yep. So. Bennett sent us an email and said, Hello, Tired Queens. I know you occasionally bring up the Academy Awards on your show, <laughs> and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this year's ceremony, infamous, infamous slaps aside. What did you think of the eventual Best Picture win? I also remember you both talking well about last year's Best Picture winner, Nomadland. That's true. I'm curious to know your thoughts on that film as well, since I'm a little bit bewildered at its win. It was a good film for what it was, but even though it became last year's front runner, it never screamed Oscar material to me. Both that and Coda seemed much more like the Spirit Awards material, but somehow that seems to be changing. Also, I found your take on The Shape of Water amusing. How was gobbling up a whole fucking cat not a deal breaker for more people? He didn't say fucking, but that's what I heard. Because you have to sometimes. I just have to. Um, you know, I disagree with the Nomad Land thing. I thought it was like straight Americana and it yeah. had something to say about the, the Great Recession, which is when it, you know, takes place. Uh, we all lived through that. I was living through that at the beginning of my career and finishing up school and stuff. It was pretty fucking devastating, you know? And so I remember what that felt like. And that film really captured it. 
And Chloe Zhao did a did an amazing job with direction in it. Yeah, I completely agree with Chris. And I mean, I I sing this movie's praises anytime that I talk about it. I think that No Man Land really deserved to win Best Picture. And compared to the other things that were nominated, like it just like those movies did not hold a candle to what that movie is. Like I don't Chloe even remember the other nominees. I mean, like Promising Young Woman. You know, yeah. I mean, like. I don't know. And it was, that was a really bad ceremony too. And so like the, the few things that were like bright spots and it was like Nomadland winning and Frances McDormand winning, you know, I mean, cause she did excellent in that movie. It's a well-made, beautiful movie. She was, yeah, it was great. Everything about it was great. Um, you know, I, I do want to say like, there's a lot of movies out there that are more good than they're important or more important than they are good. Mm-hmm. I, I would think I would argue that like Moonlight as an example of that is more yeah. important than it is good versus this movie I felt like was just as good as it was important, you know, and it had something to say about American life, you know, and I thought this is this is something that we want to like keep and, and it will probably, you know, end up in the Library of Congress or something like that. I'm sure. And as far as Coda goes, I thought that Coda was a great movie. I have still not seen it. It's it was excellent. Five stars for me. It's what I wanted to win. And it won. And that almost never happens for me. So that's two years in a row that the Academy like chose the movie that I wanted to win. Well, so, I was just pissed off the entire night because Green Knight wasn't nominated for anything. And right. it should have been for cinematography, possibly costumes, um, music, mm-hmm. you know, and like uh, adapted screenplay, things like that. But it wasn't nominated for shit. And uh, that pisses me off. You still have to see it a second time because you'll you start yeah. unpeeling the layers of the onion. The second time you see it, the first time I, I liked it probably on the level that you did, but it looked so pretty. I had to see it again. And then I started appreciating everything else that was going on. So if I mean, anyone I, hasn't I, seen it, see it. If you've seen it, see it again. It needs, it should have had some Oscar nominations. I mean, yeah. like, it was a good movie. It, it There are lots of things. It was deserved to be in some categories. So one thing that really pissed me off after the fact, because I didn't realize this even at the time, even as I was fucking voting and looking at it, was that Flea was nominated for three different awards, Best Picture Awards, so Best Documentary, mm-hmm. yep. Best Animated Film, and Best Foreign Film. Yep. Or Best Foreign Language Film, I guess. Yeah. And it's, I, I sat down and watched the entire thing. You watched part of it. Yeah, I think about like 15 or 20 minutes left in the movie. Oh my God. And that's, that's it's mm-hmm. like you've turned off La La Land five minutes before that amazing ending. I know. That's what you've done to yourself. And like the, the whole, everything comes into focus so well. Like, that is an amazing fucking movie, and I will sing its praises for the rest of my life. It is so important from so many different facets, I can't even say. Like, if people don't watch fucking Flea, it's really worth it. It's amazing. It's interesting to think about. It's a beautiful, horrific story. The movie seemed really – I mean, it it is really good, and it was was just a lot. You know what I mean? Like, it was was really heavy. I had to watch it in, like, stages. Yeah. So, for people that are wondering, it's a true story about – someone surviving conflict in a foreign country and then having to immigrate and having to like take part in emergency, like leaving of countries during wartime and basically getting human trafficked in Russia and, and everything else. And also at the same time being a gay man, yep, you know, during all this time. And uh, so it's, it's a very interesting story. And I will finish it because it, it does seem also very good and very important. You know what I mean? Like Nomadland. Mm-hmm. And so I really thought that flea would at least win one of those things. You know what I mean? But like, <sighs> I don't know. At the very least, documentary, but it's okay. Yeah. What I mean, Summer of Soul was a really good documentary, so it deserved to win too. So Jamie over on Instagram sent us a DM, and he said, "Hi Robert and Chris, I just discovered your podcast on Spotify totally by accident, and have not stopped listening for about a week. I fucking love it. I am obsessed with music and have three kids, meaning I don't get much time to listen. So if I choose a podcast over an album, it must be good." I am loving it so much that I wanted to drop you a line and tell you how great I think it is and how funny you guys are. Your banter kills me. It's a shame I didn't find you during our long lockdown here in the UK, as you would have made it far more entertaining. Anyway, I found you now at least. Peace and love, Jamie. I love that. Me too. Thank you, Jamie. That's so awesome. We've gotten we've gotten quite a few like messages from people in the UK, like the UK and Ireland. Yeah. As of late. Yeah, which is awesome. I love it. Yeah. We're going to come visit you. Please. Give us somewhere to stay. (laughs) (laughs) Can we stay with you, Jamie? (laughs) We have a a voicemail from Bennett asking us a question. So here that is. Hello, Tired Queens, and happy Easter today. This is Bennett calling there. Uh, I was just uh, uh, thinking of calling and and thinking I had a uh, kind of sacrilegious um, 
recommendation for you guys or something I thought about that. I wondered if you guys ever thought about doing a deep dive on the Passion of the Christ as horror adjacent or potentially torture porn. Just thought I'd put that out there and see what you think about that. Bye. Dear Bennett, no. <laughs> no, uh, we actually have talked about it multiple times. And yeah. things and things kind of adjacent to that, you know, um, things like Schindler's List or you know, uh, Come and See or things like that are obviously like kind of real life horror. Uh, uh, Passion of the Christ is it's very much its own thing. Yeah, right. Separate from that a little bit is it torture porn? There's elements, sure. There's definitely fantastical elements. I like the portrayal of like demons and and Lucifer in there. Um, there's not much of a story going on it's it is mostly just you know jesus getting ripped apart um you know but i i I don't think i would ask myself to watch that again Mm. let alone my my listeners yeah i would not you know but it is an interesting conversation to talk about horror adjacency and i I would do the most horror in an adjacent you know movie i mean i would consider that a full-on horror movie i wouldn't even call it adjacent i mean like it just it it is i mean it's about violence we talk about a downer ending yeah (laughs) he is risen he does rise at the very fucking end. That's right. <laughs> I'm talking about the movie. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would, I saw that movie one time. I'll never watch it again. It might actually be interesting to deep dive because there's a lot of interesting making of stuff like Jim Caviezel. Caviezel. Yeah, I'm not gonna sit um, there and say Caviezel either for an hour. Jim Caviezel. Yeah, being <laughs> struck by lightning twice on the set. You know. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, all kinds of shit okay. happened. <laughs> So we're not going to do a deep dive into Passion of the Christ. Chris is just going to give us fun facts. <laughs> we're going to call it a day. Yeah. <laughs> the blood budget was higher than the actual like pay for the cinematographer. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I'm sure that's true, too. Uh, but the answer to your question, Bennett, yes, we have talked about that before. It is probably will never come to fruition. Yeah, I think we would do The Omen and any given other religious horror before we would you know, do yeah. that. Just like we've done like Rosemary's Baby and things like that. But we do consider it a horror or horror adjacent movie for sure. We do need to do The Omen. I love the I've seen it so long. I had some Gregory Peck in my life. That's right. He's always like looking at people with an arched eyebrow and a blue suit in that movie. We got a, another DM from Dr. Joe, and he said, So, Film Flamers, I finally watched Suspiria. Loved it. And a couple of other Argento films. Didn't realize that one of my faves, Dressed to Kill, was another Giallo type film. I'm noticing a lot of color and vibrance and red herrings to keep the viewer subtly suspenseful. So you both really need to see the killing of a sacred deer. It's not giallo per se, but has aspects. I remember reading Flannery O'Connor in high school and being introduced to the grotesque. Events and people are presented in such a twisted way that you have no choice but to notice. The movies, This movie is like that. Even the acting is done in monotone, and for most of the film, to accentuate the stuff that's actually going on. And the soundtrack. Imagine The Shining with less subtlety. I passed this one by a couple times before actually watching it. It deserves a watch. It's poignant. It's visceral. It's harrowing. It's heavy. All with stunning color and sound. And you're talking about the killing of the sacred deer? Yeah. Hmm. Didn't you recently watch that? Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't have a giallo vibe at all to me. And I, I, I wouldn't remember any of stunning color or sound. Anything like Suspiria. It's like a normal movie. Hmm. You know, especially now, it, feel, it feels like it's especially kind of desaturated in a way. Okay. Uh, maybe pops of color and things like that. I just, I didn't notice that. And that's something that I would normally notice as someone that's obsessed with film aesthetic. Yeah. You know? And so I, I didn't really care for it. I haven't seen it yet. It's still really high on my list to watch. But then after I saw your rating on Letterboxd, I was like, oh, okay, maybe I... It's subtle and there's no real so what um, I mean, you could say that there's a, a layer of meaning under the surface, but it's just like, why? I, I almost don't care enough to to do it. I, I see what they're trying to do, but it's not even, you can't compare it to Giallo. You can't really compare it to The Shining either. It's very much its own thing. Do you think I would like it? No, <laughs> not necessarily. You might, you might not. It's, it's not like I didn't, it's just kind of very beige to me. Okay. I'm still intrigued, though. I've heard I've heard good things about this it, movie. It, you know, it, it ha- goes on a certain path, and, it, and it's, it's talking about like it's almost like a curse or a, a fate or something like that. And it's trying to say something about that, and it's just like, oh, you were thinking there was something actually going on when there there wasn't, but there was at the same time, and it's it's all part of the plan or something. It's just like it's, no, stop it. Okay, I will watch it eventually. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it should be in the right mind. It's space, hard to but... explain. It's decided and it wasn't the end wasn't the juice wasn't worth the squeeze for me on on the killing of the second year. I'll say that. <laughs> that, I've never heard that. That's great. <laughs> the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. 
Uh, is that a penis reference? No. Uh, <laughs> it's a no. fucking fruit reference. <laughs> Why does everyone sexualize that when I say that? I've said that at work so many times and I get weird looks. <laughs> I stop. I had to finally stop saying this. There's a you know more than one way to skin a cat. <laughs> well, I can imagine getting good looks for that. I am glad you finally watched this period. I'm glad that you loved it. Now go watch the remake and tell us what you think about that. Because it's a good comparison, and uh, it's much more along the lines of Killing of the Sacred Deer than, than the original Suspiria. Suspiria. The second, yeah. And Dress to Kill is certainly a Giallo movie. In fact, Brian De Palma makes a lot of Giallo type films. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He's kind of known for that, and you know damn well that I'm always ready to talk about Brian De Palma. So, yeah, but I'm not. That's what, one of the things about Giallo, right? Is like you're. It's, there's red herrings. You're not sure who the killer is. There's mm-hmm. a big reveal. You know, all that stuff versus like killing a sacred deer. Like, hello, I'm the killer. You know, <laughs> it's happening like a third of the movie through. So. And honestly, you had me at Flannery O'Connor. She has like some of the best fucking short stories like ever. Yeah. Well, we have a new patron, Chris. Oh, my God. Is it Sean? It is. It is Sean Homrig. Sean of the dead? <laughs> no. Sean Homrig. I hope I'm not like butchering your name, Sean. Homrig? 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 You may have to like. Send us some sort of voice message. Welcome to the family, Sean. We're glad to have you. And we also have to shout out our patrons at the Film Flamer tier or higher. And they are Ben, Dr. Joel, Kimberly, Kyle, Lisa, Penelope, Wallstrich, but especially Wallstrich. <laughs> <Ta. laughs> Horror News. So Anne Rice's The Mayfair Witches is happening on AMC. Annabeth Gish joins production. She's also in Midnight Mass alongside Alexandra Daddario. Yeah, and neither of these people are strangers to um, genre. No. I believe Alexandra Daddario has been in several genres, especially specifically horror. And of course, Annabeth Gish was in um, Midnight Mass, Mm -hmm. as well as X-Files, the latter seasons of X-Files. I thought she was excellent. Yeah. And so this is more AMC coming out with Anne Rice's work, right? They're doing that interview with Vampire and Vampire Lestat series. Uh, And of course, Mayfair Witches might be a shared universe. Uh, it, It certainly is in the books. And there's people, I've never read it, but there's people that are super, super passionate about these, these books, about the Wayfair Witches. Oh, the really? Wayfair, God damn it. The Mayfair Witches. And, uh, you know, I'm interested. I'm intrigued. I'm more intrigued about this at this point than Interview the Vampire. Because in order to make some of the casting decisions that they've made, they've had to completely change timelines. And I'm just like, okay, like, please. Like, you don't have to try that hard. There's there's a lot of roles in the Vampire Chronicles where you can have certain people play certain parts without having to work so hard. Yeah. No, I think I know what you're talking about. I'm still interested to see... Uh, the Vampire Chronicles because they've come out with so many like pictures. I mean, and things don't get me like wrong. I'm, I'm proud woke. You know, I will use yeah. that as a trigger for myself. You know, it's not <laughs> to me. That's not a pejorative. No. Well, we also had that comment from a listener who said that she saw it being filmed, right, or mm. whatever, and she said it looks super gay or whatever she saw. Well, it should did. be. Yeah, I mean, and so I hope so. I mean, the in between the words, you can't hide from that when something's being filmed. I just I know nothing about the Mayfair Witches. I know those books are very popular. Right. But I mean, I've been saying I need to go through Anne Rice's oeuvre for quite some time now. And I just keep adding just start with the Sleeping Beauty series. That's her erotic novels. I know. Rambling. Of course, it's under uh, Rook, Rook. Yeah. Some sort of French. Some, some yeah, non player or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Sleeping Beauty series. I would totally read some fucking erotica. Didn't she also write Exit to Eden? Yes. Yeah. But that was an abortion of a movie. So we don't. Talk yeah, but about the book it. is really good. Yes, it is. I like that book yeah. a lot. Anyway, The Nun 2 is happening, unfortunately. <laughs> Although, this time directed by uh, Michael Shaves, Chavez, uh, who also did Curse of La Llorona. I don't remember which La Llorona I watched. I watched the really long and boring one. You didn't watch one. the Curse of, you watched the, regu- the, the yeah. highly I mean, it was good, one. well acted, well produced, but it was kind of boring. Um, and then The Conjuring, The Double Made Me Do It, which I actually liked. It was on my top 10. I liked it too. Uh, for a horror, I guess, last year. And uh, but written this time by the same writer as Malignant. So Yay. the Nun 2 actually looks like it could be better than the first one based on the talent coming to bear here. Uh, I think that's coming to bear here because the first one made like $250 billion or something at the box office. Yeah, it was a small budget. I had no idea. I have never seen the Nun. I, you've told me that it was at least atmospheric and moody. It's worth seeing. You know? Yeah. yeah, it's worth seeing. I think you talked about The Nun in our very first Hot Takes episode ever. Mayhaps. Yeah, all, many moons ago. Really? I, it still I, feels new. And I still haven't seen it. That's how time works for 
for old for people. Us old people. I know. Fuck. We're just like the slow march to the fucking grave. Yeah. I'll have to watch them then before I die. Mm-hmm. But yeah, in this article, it said that it made like three hundred sixty-five million dollars, and I'm like, what? I mean, like, yeah, that's really? surprising to me too. When you mentioned it today, Jesus Christ, that's a mm-hmm. lot of money. Well, speaking of a lot of money, I have to say that I, I is smart. And I is kind. <laughs> because last shooting the flames, I literally said this is the beginning of the end for Netflix. Mm-hmm. You did. You right? said mark my words. Made choices. Yeah, I said mark my words. Well, Netflix loses two hundred thousand subscribers in Q one uh, due to password sh- their password sharing crackdown, and just starting a couple countries. Right, it hasn't even done that here yet. And they lose thirty five percent of their stock value in essentially a day. I think it went up to like forty percent. This is just fucking bonkers to me. I don't know why they're doing this because I have people have gone and unearthed tweets that the official Netflix account has done that said sharing your password is love and things like that. Yes. Yeah. And now it's like, no, you can't do that. They think they've reached critical mass where they can start. Now they've hooked enough people that they're going to keep them and reap the rewards of all that you know right so but if it's actually two hundred thousand subscribers then that's those subscribers including the people that they were attached to so you know but i'm sorry we said like it's certainly a choice to cancel people's favorite shows at one or two seasons and not let these shows grow their beards yeah you know you need to be a slower process of choosing these shows and choosing quality over quantity because right now netflix has just been throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks and people and, are getting attached to shows and like we've got like is it cake right now and then we've got the bullshit game. they're coming out with all these variety shows you know just the the weirdest fucking concepts that just they're gonna see what sticks and it's just like that's not how to to do this like you have to gotta be smarter with your money because people are gonna leave in droves because they don't trust you anymore i don't I, I can never find anything to watch on netflix and the only reason that i keep netflix really is because i share my password with people who need it and they they watch things on there you know i think everyone has that you know <clears throat> like we're all sharing different things yeah you know, people are using my stuff i'm using other people's stuff like because there's like everything is just gone super you know first it was just like netflix and amazon and then now we've got there's so many different Hulu and disney and yeah. you know paramount and god everything else i'm not gonna i'm not gonna fucking subscribe to amc plus or whatever the fuck i mean i fucking cut my cable because i was i thought it was way too expensive and i went to just straight on yeah. internet and i thought well we have enough streaming services now i think i probably pay more in different streaming services than I ever did in my cable bill. I'm, it's getting to that point. You know, and so I'm like, and the thing is that I, I tend to watch the same services over and over again. I'm going to have to start streamlining that a little bit and just say, you know, I don't need Netflix if I'm not going to have the kind of content of things that I want to watch. All that I watch on Netflix is like true crime documentaries. You know what I mean? That's what it is. But I can get that shit other places. I have you know? Disney and Hulu from you. I'm sharing Netflix with my friend Diane. Uh, Amazon, you can't, it's harder, to, much harder to share Amazon because that's your account like, right. for everything. Yeah, I don't really share Amazon. And that, yeah, it's just difficult for that one. Uh, Paramount I'm sharing with, with you. Mm-hmm. And then I have Apple from, <laughs> from one of our patrons, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sam, right. Who's of course my real life friend. And, uh, yeah, so it's just like aggregate. We all just need to come together and be like, okay, you take these two. I'll take these two. I know. We're just like redo it. So no one gets just gutted with all this shit. I want an aggregate, you know, I want some sort of service. I think some, some uh, in Canada, they have a service, like an aggregate service that subscribes you to like five or six of them. And then has one fucking UI for all of the shows. Well, and all of this may be changing anyway, because there are some cities in Texas, I think Fort Worth is on one of those lists where they're going to start charging Netflix for being just a subscription program for some reason. They say they're missing out on taxes from this. And I don't even know how that works, but I've heard about it in the news. I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of things going on, like the streamers. Uh, a couple of years ago, wanted to charge Netflix for all of the streaming traffic mm-hmm. and bandwidth, you know, because they were just having to deal with it as providers. And I think that's it, actually. Yeah. And so they were like, no, we're a service and you're a commodity. You know, like it's all this stuff that's happening. But like we said, you know, it was like the golden age of streaming was not about content. It was about access. And now that everything is just everyone's trying to do their own fucking thing. And now we're starting to see them fail. CNN Plus is an example. Oh, yeah. We might see some bigger ones. I think a couple of CBS, right, turned into Paramount. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's some some consolidations happening, and there's a lot of movement with streaming right now. And they're, they're gonna all have just struggling, to. you know. I mean, HBO Max recently came out and said they don't care about password sharing. They're like, we're good. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, like, that really kind of needs to be. Well, they're new. They're newer than Netflix. So it's, well, it's true. They're all going to crack down eventually because they have to maximize their subscribers. The world we live in and technology is agile, right? So there's two week sprints, and every single sprint you have to be iterative. And every quarter, every half, every year, you have to uh, you have KPIs, metrics mm-hmm. that you have to have higher. Otherwise, you fail or get fired or, or get moved somewhere else, you know. And so those conversions, those number of counts gained, those time spent uh, watching streaming shows, amount of shows watched, all of these are metrics that they track. And if they're not higher, then when push comes to shove, they're going to start doing some dark practices like, you know, going against what they previously said about password sharing or things like that to shore up those numbers. <clears throat> Do you think that this is going to last, though? I mean, do you think it's going to make it to America and it will survive? No. No. I mean, I, I really think that eventually that they will not. The oligarchy has crap. so much more power in America than it does in Canada. Yeah. So yeah. Canadians are a little bit more free than we are. Here. I don't know. Like, Netflix, be best. <laughs> okay. As Melania says, <laughs> be best. <laughs> Finally, Bruce Greenwood is replacing Frank Langella in Mike Flanagan's The Fall of the House of Usher due to misconduct. What is going on with all our fucking heroes? I mean, like, fucking Bill Murray has just been removed from an Aziz Ansari Mm -hmm. (laughs) directed. And he was in trouble from, uh, like, a Me Too thing a little bit. Well, which I didn't agree with for his specific case. I honestly. Can, yeah, I, I agree. But uh, Bill Murray and fucking Frank Langella, like all of these people around that certain age are kind of starting to like have the zero tolerance thing. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Well, I mean, so. you can't act like that anyway. Like I know that Bill Murray, like I, what I heard on the news was that he was like sometimes physically violent to people. Well, he was a douche. Like, there was a lot of stories about him uh, and Lucy Liu on Charlie's Angels. He seems like a douche. He he could be. Like, there's all these stories about how awesome he is randomly. Mm. But when you have to actually work with him and he's there every day, like, he's a fucking asshole. And he, uh, I think uh, Richard Dreyfuss said, like, on What About Bob that he almost, like, they almost killed each other. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the plot of the movie. (laughs) No, like, in real life, yeah. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, like, I don't know what this does to Mike Flanagan's production, right? Because this show is supposed to you be You got Bruce out, fucking too. Greenwood, who he Which, works wonderfully with. Yeah. And Bruce Greenwood's always good. He's been in several of his films and TV shows, right? Yeah, it's like his fourth or fifth or sixth yeah. collaboration. He's certainly in Dr. Sleep. He even had a little cameo as a ghost in The Haunting of Hill House. Oh, I'm going to watch that again, too. I'm super looking forward to The House of Usher, though. Yeah. I'm going to throw in lots of Poe. I would have rather something. I, I want Flanagan to do an original again. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it's been a while. Although my, one of my favorites is Haunting of Hill House, which is not super original, but it really is. Really. It's using that as a framing device, but it really is. So it'll be really interesting to see what his personal take is on the fall of the House of Usher. I think it's multiple Poe stories, too. It's not just that one. Oh, okay. It's a lot of like the Poe oeuvre. Oh, so it's going to be like an like an anthology? Uh, or maybe like just different things put into the same universe or whatnot. Oh, okay. I don't really know. He's, he's only like really that stupid best, Stephen but... King show where everything happened in that town or whatever. Oh yeah. I stopped watching that <laughs> like during the first season. I was like, I can't watch this shit. It's not, it's not scary. Everything Poe. It's also not good. <laughs> hey um, baby. But he also want to take a ride with me. Sorry. <laughs> hey pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's also doing the Midnight Society or Midnight Club, whatever the hell. I think Fucking it's... can't wait for all of the Christopher Pike stuff in the pipeline. Right. So, I mean. Almost he... a pike line. <laughs> the pike line? That's what I call it. Mike Flanagan's pike line. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> I can't wait for that. I can't wait for Midnight Society. And then I cannot wait for Netflix to cancel it after the first season. season. And then I can't wait for Season of Passage, which I have not heard of anything since he originally announced it. He's it's focusing on these shows. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but it will happen eventually. Hopefully. Coming soon. The baby. <laughs> What'd you call me? The baby. <laughs> Nobody puts baby in the corner. Nobody puts baby in the limited series. Yeah, so this is a limited series from HBO called The Baby. And it's a dark, 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 dark comedy. Um, I had not heard about this at all. I hadn't seen the trailer until we watched it today together and but i have seen some people reacting to the first episode so far on social media and they love it and now that i've seen the trailer which we can talk about uh i kind of want to watch it too yeah it it almost seems like a like a 
subtle supernatural, which I like. Yeah. Subtle supernatural where the baby's like killing everyone. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but the, the comedy's kind of subsumed, right? It's really like under, it's like you know, kind of British comedy. Yeah, it's very dry. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like, and I like that. You yeah, know me too. I, mean? I really enjoy that level of comedy. Very, very dry, very British. I'm, I'm good with it. And um, clearly this baby has some sort of like power or something. And like I'm intrigued and yeah. I would like to watch it. It seems like it's well acted. It seems like it's well shot. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's just a really good modern looking limited series. Speaking of good acting and um, well shot, the opposite of that is our <laughs> next trailer with Land Shark, which I added here just for you. Thank you. <laughs> I cannot believe that this one passed me by how did i not see land shark before today i don't know yeah i think it was out or streaming or something but it's gonna be on dvd in, in may it's like a streaming you know uh straight to release thing because it just looks like a pile of shit and then uh of course the baby is on hbo right now sorry we didn't say that's right and all it. of these are linked the trailers are all linked in the show notes as sure. well as our news items yep so land shark yeah it's about a <laughs> <laughs> it's about a land shark. It's about a giant shark that can be either in the water or on land. <laughs> I think there's multiple sharks because the one was all crusty. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it had some sort of like armor on it or Maybe something. Maybe it's before or after. I don't know. I don't know. There are some moments in that trailer like they literally just stole things from Deep Blue Sea. Like, or like, Free Willy. <laughs> or Free Willy. Like shot for shot. They just yeah. took it. And it looks ridiculous. And I'm kind of here for it. So <laughs> land shark, everybody. Check it out. <laughs> uh, there is another. Well, speaking of Netflix, we saw a trailer for a true crime documentary, which is all that I keep Netflix for, really, called Our Father. And this is sort of about a doctor in a Midwest town who was impregnating women with his own semen. Yeah, so he was a fertility doctor, and right. he was uh, replacing the the other semen with his own. And so, like, people are walking down the street. And essentially finding out through DNA tests and everything else. And then like the snowball kind of kept rolling. And so they're walking down the street and like finding, oh, there's a cousin. Oh, that's my brother. That's a half brother. There's like, like what, how many, like dozens, Uh more than dozens of like half brothers and half sisters in this town. And you can only hope to death that you haven't slept with one of them. Like, or or already married to one of them or or something. Oh my God. Yeah. I remember when this news hit, because this is a true story. I remember this news hit a couple of years ago and it was just, absolutely stunning i had never even heard of this case or anything about it yeah so when i watched this i mean i think i sent you this trailer when i watched it and i was like holy fucking shit i was like this is like bonkers and i can't wait to watch this show i think they ended up charging him with rape even though it was the procedure because he was putting his own semen in oh my god right so i think they did like 60 counts of rape or something like that it's crazy yeah, I can't wait I'm to watch sure. this. I hope it's a I hope it's like a documentary movie and not a documentary series. I don't need it to last that long. Just tell me the story quickly. No, they're interviewing the actual people in it, so Ugh, I'm so ready. May eleventh on Netflix, guys. I'm mm-hmm. sure we'll be talking about this in some sort of like hot takes episode at some point. Yeah. Next up, we've got Crimes of the Future, which is a new David Cronenberg film only in theaters in June. This is premiered at Cannes and has had some interesting Feedback, I think. Uh, well, I don't think people have seen it. Can hasn't happened yet, has it? Well, it said it's premiering at Can for sure. Hmm. But I, if, if they've already seen it, it's good. I I know I that they made it through. <laughs> <laughs> they keep saying that they're expecting people to walk out of the theater, and that the last parts of this movie are like the most shocking ever. All right. Well. So, I mean, like David Cronenberg, maybe a return to form for him because lately he's been making things like a history of violence. And lately, that was like 15 years ago. <laughs> that was like one of his most recent movies. Wow. And, but he seems to be going back to body horror with this one. Yeah, it does seem that way. So, I don't. And Viggo Mortensen. I will watch it just because I like Cronenberg. But mm-hmm. yeah, now I need to know if some people have seen it or not. I should know better about like film festivals. I should know when can happens. It's terrible. Well, maybe perhaps they'll show it at ours. <gasps> They're showing this stupid black phone movie. We're going to watch it though. <laughs> I do like the director of that movie. I know. I mean, I like his work too. And so I'm, I feel like we're maybe shitting the on the trailer. Back. Yeah. We go watch, we'll probably walk out of that and be like, Oh my God, it's the best fucking movie. I don't know. Fucking Christian Slater or whatever his name is. No, Ethan Hawke. <laughs> <laughs> I always confuse those two people. I don't know why. Uh, Ethan Hawke is also the main bad guy in um, uh, Moon Knight that's out on Disney Plus right now. It's like a 
He's in that show? It's, it was in the Marvel Knights, like the darker comics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so he's the main bad guy in that. He's the main bad guy. It's super place. dry, and like all the shows that are coming out now, just like all the genre shows especially, seem like they're like, they're made for, for like water cooler moments. Uh, yeah. Like an outline of water cooler moments, and then like, okay, the rest is filler. Like mm-hmm. this is a filler episode, that's a filler episode. Here's like, and just fill it with like fight scenes or like interpersonal relationship stuff that doesn't matter to the whole thing, you know? And it's just so lazy compared to what they used to do with shows back like in the 90s, early 2000s, or even 80s when they're making 22 fucking episodes a season and each episode was episodic, not serialized. And so it was super heavy writing, right? Yeah. Versus now, it's like, where the fuck are the writers? This thing, you could just film something randomly, like it didn't matter the actual story. Anyway, that was a whole diet <laughs> this is a long diatribe there sorry but I, I know where you're coming from i think we can thank ryan murphy for that partly too though because there was yeah. a, there was kind of a dearth of like genre tv shows and then we have american horror story and everyone's trying to capitalize on like limited series quote unquote and they're just not doing it very well even he's not doing it very well so i mean some of them are good wanda was good because every episode was very different loki was good but they're, and they're still getting those water cooler moments. But if you have good writing, it's worth it. Versus some of these shows, if they'd really try that outline thing and then fill in between the lines, mm. it really shows if they don't have good writers. We're going to watch Wanda, I think, next weekend. Oh, okay. The last trailer on our list is a Pete Davidson movie coming out in August, and it's called Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Well, it's not a Pete Davidson movie. He's in it. He's in it, yeah. And he's fine. He's always fine. He's fine. I don't, I don't get the whole fascination with him. I certainly don't understand how he's attracting all of these beautiful women. <laughs> I think he's kind of cute in a like crypt keeper kind of way, like sunken eyes. His eyes look like buttholes. Like yeah, he's like meth addict sexy. Meth addict sexy, giant yeah. teeth. I mean, like really, <laughs> giant teeth, big ass lips. He has some DSL. I mean, come on. Yeah, but bug eyes. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, I was talking about questioning someone's taste level earlier, and now I'm starting to question my own. Yeah, I'm just like, this. how, how is this happening? How is, how is he with Kim fucking Kardashian? <laughs> I don't know. That really does boggle my mind. <laughs> how is he, like, how, in what universe? We are in the stupidest fucking universe where Pete Davidson is the opposite or, like, in the romantic triangle with Kanye. <laughs> you know, like, what is happening? Anyway, bodies, bodies, bodies. It looks right up there with like ready or not kind of yeah. tone. Mm-hmm. Uh, except this one is more like more of a generational moment for those Gen Z people. Like, you know, uh, th- you have to watch this trailer. So good. It's coming out in theaters in August, but it just looks so hilarious and really dark and bloody and everything else at the same time. It looks funny. I mean, like another really good a 24 movie. Like, honestly, I mean, it's based on it. the game. Yeah. I'm going, is it really? Bodies, bodies, bodies. Oh, That's the game they're playing. Oh, is it, but is it an actual game? Anyone want to play bodies, bodies, bodies? <laughs> it's a murder mystery. It's a dinner party murder mystery, essentially. Right? So I'm going to watch this movie, and then I'm going to have my Halloween party based on, <laughs> on whatever they're doing. And I'll just be like, <laughs> why are you making this all about you? <laughs> <laughs> I f- don't gaslight me. <laughs> it really does look funny. I feel like I'm being silenced. <laughs> all those fucking Gen Z buzz phrases. It, yeah. it looks really fucking hilarious. So yeah, go check this. Go check that trailer out. All these trailers, actually. And let us know what you think. Yeah. Well, I think that just about wraps up our Shooting the Flames episode for May of 2022. As always, we want to know what you think about anything that we've talked about. We need those comments and questions. You can leave those on social media at the Film Flamers on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at tiredqueens at filmflamers.com or call us at 972-666-7733. Mmm. Put your land shark on our bodies, bodies, bodies. <laughs> yeah, the ads. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> mm. Plumar Island. <laughs> what do I have to say mm, in front of all of them? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like I just tasted something delicious but want to say something really horny. I don't understand. Be my groomer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. Guys, we have a lot of content coming out for you in May. <clears throat> it's Nicole Kidman month, randomly. And we are gonna be, <laughs> we're gonna be talking about we're gonna be talking about the others and Eyes Wide Shut. That's right. Which I still have not seen. 
sexy ass horror adjacency. That's right. That's what that is. Mm -hmm. And if you need more of the Film Flamers content, and we know you do, head over to patreon.com slash the Film Flamers, find all of our bonus episodes, and you can help us choose another Nicole Kim movie to cover over there on a poll. And that was the night the lights went out. (laughs) I'm Plum Island. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have to get out of the nook, you guys. So we're going to go off and have some <laughs> sweet, sweet dreams. dreams. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to us? I don't happened? know. It's hot. <laughs> <laughs> we wham. <laughs> <laughs>